Welcome to part 36 of the Ultimate Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg, where we explore true crime, urban legends, mysterious disappearances, myths and legends, and more. The Winchester Mystery House. The Winchester Mystery House, a sprawling architectural marvel in San Jose, California, is famed for its strange construction and haunting legacy. This 160-room mansion was the brainchild of Sarah Winchester, widow of William Wirt Winchester, treasurer of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company, and son of Oliver Winchester, the founder. After inheriting a vast fortune following her husband's death in 1881, Sarah embarked on a continuous construction project that would consume the last 38 years of her life. The origins of the house date back to 1884, when Sarah purchased an eight-room farmhouse in California's Santa Clara Valley. Driven by either the advice of a psychic or her own whims, she transformed this somewhat modest start into a labyrinthine mansion without the help of an architect. This resulted in a structure with doors that lead to brick walls and staircases that go nowhere, amongst numerous other oddities. So perhaps she should have retained an architect, but if she did, the house would be one of thousands of others like it, rather than what it became famed for. The house features numerous innovations and luxuries rare for its time, including multiple kitchens, indoor plumbing, and a sophisticated gas lighting system. And I mean that in a literal sense though the unusual nature of the house also means that it is probably figuratively gaslighting everyone who enters it as well. Among its more curious aspects are the staircases leading directly into ceilings and windows that open into other rooms, all built under Sarah's meticulous direction. Much of the lore surrounding the Winchester Mystery House stems from Sarah's belief that she was haunted by the spirits of those killed by Winchester rifles. Urban legends indicate that Sarah would conduct seances on a nightly basis in an attempt to commune with these vengeful spirits. However, it is unclear if this was actually the case. This belief in these angry ghosts supposedly led her to continue the house's construction incessantly as stopping would mean her own demise. She even incorporated the number 13 into many parts of the house, which added to its mystique and further fueled tales of its haunting. The mystery deepened after Sarah's death in 1922, when no mention of the mansion was found in her will. Her belongings were auctioned off, and the house was quickly deemed worthless due to its bizarre design and structural damage from an earthquake. However, just five months later, it was opened to the public, attracting those fascinated by its legends and architectural oddities. Today, the Winchester Mystery House stands not only as a monument to its eccentric owner, but also as a testament to the mysteries and legends that continue to draw millions of visitors. Notably, numerous visitors and staff have also reported paranormal experiences while in the Winchester Mystery House. A number of theories have been proposed to explain these phenomena. Some posit that there are ghostly forces at play in the mansion, citing numerous accounts over the course of nearly 100 years. Others theorize that confirmation bias could explain these unusual encounters given that people who explore the mansion are more likely to be believers in ghosts than the general population. And for those unaware, confirmation bias is the theory that people favor information which aligns with their worldview. Another school of thought suggests that there is a localized mass hysteria surrounding the Winchester Mystery House. Individuals entering the house may interpret otherwise normal interactions as unusual or paranormal when they may not have done so under normal circumstances. To illustrate this point, we've all heard loud and unexplained creaks in houses before, and under normal circumstances, these are written off as nothing. 
However, if you're in the Winchester Mystery House, the overlay of localized mass hysteria could strongly color how you interpret such an event. Regardless of whether the location is haunted or not, it's an experience that is so significant that it draws tourists from around the world. Porfirios. This is a suggestion by Discord community member Black Rabbit. Porfirios, a name that instilled dread among the Byzantine sailors of the 6th century, refers to a colossal whale infamous for its ship-sinking exploits in the waters around Constantinople. This creature, active for over five decades, captured the imagination and concern of Emperor Justinian I, who prioritized its capture or destruction to ensure the safety of maritime routes. The origins of the name Porfirios remain a topic of speculation. Some suggest it might relate to the Greek or Roman Byzantine lore, possibly linked to divine or giant figures. Alternatively, it could derive from the Greek word for purple, reflecting the perceived color of the whale, or as reference to the creature as an emperor amongst whales. Notably, the color purple was associated with the Byzantine imperial household lending credence to this idea. As an amusing aside, if the purple hypothesis is correct, some scholars suggest that Porfirios is accurately translated as purple boy. I'm not quite sure why, but there's something so inherently funny about giving a massive terror whale a cute name like purple boy. The exact species of Porfirios is also debated with some historians suggesting it might have been a sperm whale due to its size and lifespan. Others porpoise it could have been an unusually large orca, a species more likely to be found in the region's waters. That said, both sorts of creatures are found throughout the Eastern Mediterranean. The whale's activities were so disruptive that they became a significant legend in the historical narrative of the Byzantine Empire. According to the primary historical accounts from Procopius, Porfirios was a relentless force in the seas, known to attack not only merchant and fishing vessels, but also warships. This persistent threat led to an array of speculative and sometimes mystical explanations for its behavior and even its very existence. The end of Porfirios was as dramatic as its life. After a prolonged period of terror, the whale ran aground near the mouth of the Black Sea while chasing dolphins. Despite the efforts of the locals armed with axes and ropes, the whale was not immediately subdued. It was eventually cut into pieces after a significant struggle with the locals. Though Purple Boy may have been a terror, it's sad to see him go in such a way. Also, notably, this unintentional beaching has been cited as further evidence that Porfirios was indeed a sperm whale. This event was recorded with a blend of relief and triumph by the local populace, who had long lived in the shadow of this aggressive creature. Notably, Porfirios has cast a long shadow across human culture as a whole. Perhaps most importantly to our context, Porfirios is mentioned in Herman Melville's great American classic about a similarly aggressive whale. Also, if there's a lesson here for any whales in the audience, it seems that only poorly behaved whales make the history books. The Golden Rock. One of Myanmar's most fascinating landmarks is the Golden Rock, also known as Kayak Teyo Pagoda. This iconic site, perched precariously on the edge of a cliff in Mon State, is a testament to both natural wonder and profound spirituality. The Golden Rock is a spectacle of geological and religious significance that dates back thousands of years. According to local legend, the rock maintains its delicate balance due to a single strand of the Buddha's hair enshrined within the pagoda atop the rock. This strand was supposedly given to a hermit by the Buddha himself, who then passed it to King Tissa, a local ruler in the region at the time. 
The king found a boulder that resembled the hermit's head and placed the pagoda on it to house the sacred relic. This historical intertwining of nature and divinity gives the site its revered status among Buddhists, with the site being a major pilgrimage destination. Geologically, the Golden Rock is a large granite boulder that appears to defy gravity. Granite, known for its durability and beauty, typically forms from slowly cooled magma deep within the Earth's crust. Over millennia, natural forces such as erosion and tectonic activity sculpted the surrounding landscape, eventually leaving the boulder teetering dramatically on the edge of the cliff. The exact reasons behind its precarious positioning remains a topic of fascination for geologists. Geologists have attempted to find some sort of naturalistic explanation for this wonder. But as yet, there is no clear indication why the rock is placed as it is. If you're enjoying my content, please hit the like and subscribe buttons and the notification bell. My goal is to make the most extensive iceberg series in YouTube history, and I want you along for the ride. Also, be sure to check out the Discord server, if you're into that sort of thing. We're closing in on 100 members now. Also, if you really want to take it to the next level, please consider signing up for a YouTube membership or a Patreon membership. You can support for as little as 99 cents a month. Captain Ginyu's True Form Captain Ginyu, the leader of the Ginyu Force in the Dragon Ball series, is well known for his body change ability, which allows him to swap bodies with others. This unique skill has led to much speculation about his original form, and whether the form known to fans is indeed his true, original body. The body change technique is not only a pivotal aspect of Ginyu's character, but also a cornerstone of his interactions in the series. It allows him to take over the body of any being, gaining their strengths and abilities while they inherit his body. The new body retains the power level and skills of its original owner, not Ginyu's original capabilities. The question of Ginyu's true form is intriguing because it raises the possibility that what viewers see might not be his original body at all. This ambiguity is rooted in the nature of his body change ability, which he has likely used numerous times. It's theorized that Ginyu may have swapped bodies multiple times to gain strategic advantages or to survive perilous situations. This theory is bolstered by his own associates being unclear as to what his original form is or was. Further, as seen during the Frieza saga, Captain Ginyu does not have the ability to simply transform back into his old body. The body swap ability is a complete and permanent swap if successfully pulled off. According to a non-canonical drawing by Toyotaro, the chosen successor of the creator of the series, Akira Toriyama, rest in paradise, Captain Ginyu was actually not originally a purple-horned creature. Rather, Ginyu encountered an extremely strong alien of this species and performed his famous body change technique on the creature. Notably, however, Akira Toriyama never officially commented on Captain Ginyu's original form, and even the non-canonical drawing does not indicate what Ginyu's previous form actually was. For now, the true original form of Captain Ginyu remains a mystery with all attempts to explain his original form being entirely speculative in nature. Last Thursdayism. Last Thursdayism is a provocative philosophical argument that challenges our perceptions of reality and the universe's age. This thought experiment suggests that the universe, along with all evidence of historical events and personal memories, might have been created as recently as last Thursday. The underlying implication of this idea is a critique of empirical certainty in historical and cosmological sciences. The origins of Last Thursdayism are closely tied to a broader philosophical debate 
surrounding the credibility and interpretation of scientific and religious accounts of the universe's origins. Critics of Last Thursdayism argue that it is unfalsifiable and unverifiable, meaning it cannot be proven or disproven by scientific methods. This characteristic aligns it with other philosophical skeptics' ideas, like Bertrand Russell's five-minute hypothesis. This posits that the universe could have been created five minutes ago, complete with preformed memories and historical evidence. Of course, you cannot disprove such a theory, as any evidence you have against it is supported by the fact that all memories and evidence were already preformed with the universe. Last Thursdayism serves as a modern philosophical tool to question the epistemological foundations of our understanding of the universe. It prompts a deeper reflection on how we interpret and validate knowledge and the inherent assumptions underlying scientific methods. The hypothesis, by design, leads to discussions about the nature of truth, observation, and the limits of scientific inquiry. It encourages a skeptical viewpoint on the absoluteness of empirical evidence, suggesting that such evidence could be as much a construct of specific assumptions as it is a reflection of an external reality. In essence, Last Thursdayism isn't just the idea that the universe started last Thursday, it's a gateway into questioning deeper philosophical and existential dilemmas about reality, knowledge, and belief systems. The Chatham County Blood Shower. This is an obscure and interesting suggestion from Discord community member Shay. Remember, if you have a recommendation for the series, please consider joining the Discord server or leaving a comment below. On February 25, 1884, an extraordinary natural phenomenon occurred in Chatham County, North Carolina, known as the Blood Shower. Mrs. Kit Lassiter, a resident of New Hope Township, experienced what seemed like a sudden downpour, only to discover that it was not water, but blood that had fallen. This unsettling event left the ground and surrounding vegetation covered in what appeared to be blood over an area of approximately 60 feet in circumference. Witnesses, including neighbors who visited the site after hearing Mrs. Lassiter's account, confirmed the strange occurrence. The substance, collected for analysis, was sent to Dr. F. P. Venable, a professor at the University of North Carolina. The tests conducted by Venable mostly confirmed the substance's blood yet no definitive explanation could be offered for this bizarre event. Of course, advanced testing was not available at the time to determine what the source of the blood was. Notably, at the time that the blood shower occurred, it was not possible to determine anything beyond the fact that the substance was indeed organic in nature. What species the blood came from could also not be determined at the time. Notably, the incident was thoroughly documented in contemporaneous scientific journals, as well as in local newspapers at the time. One possible explanation for phenomena like the blood shower could be related to environmental or meteorological conditions. For instance, strong updrafts and thunderstorms are known to lift small animals, like frogs or fish, into the air and then drop them miles away. A similar mechanism might theoretically lift blood or blood-like substances into the air as well. Another theory is that water spouts, which can pick up substances and mix them with rain, creating the appearance of blood, were responsible. Additionally, certain types of red algae or dust could be swept up and then fall with rain, giving a blood-like appearance upon deposition. These hypotheses, while plausible, often require very specific circumstances and remain largely speculative in the present case. Further, while the case was properly investigated scientifically at the time, the right investigative tools simply did not exist yet. Did Ivan the Terrible really slay his son? 
The historical narrative surrounding Ivan the Terrible and the demise of his son, Ivan Ivanovich, is steeped in drama and tragedy. This event has achieved wider appeal due to cultural depictions like Ilya Repin's famous painting depicting the aftermath. Notably, Ivan's common nickname, the Terrible, does not speak to his abilities as a ruler, but his ability to inspire awe and fear in his enemies. Recent scholarly discourse and analysis suggest that the well-known tale of Ivan causing his son's demise in a fit of rage may not align with historical facts. Ivan the Terrible was the first czar of all Russia, and his reign was marked by considerable expansion and autocratic control, but also by notorious brutality. The incident involving his son Ivan in 1581 is one of the most tragic episodes associated with his reign. Traditional accounts, influenced heavily by Ilya Repin's artwork, depict a grief-stricken Ivan immediately after he had allegedly struck his son, leading to the young man's injury. According to this account, Ivan struck his son in the head with a scepter. However, this account has been challenged by historians who argue that it might have been more myth than reality. For instance, some historians point out that there were no contemporary records accusing Ivan the Terrible of his son's fatal outcome. Instead, it was noted that Ivan Ivanovich suffered from an illness or poisoning given the high levels of mercury found in the exhumed remains of the family. This suggests a possible accidental poisoning rather than a violent altercation. Further adding to the skepticism, the dramatic narrative of the Tsar causing his son's fatal injury may have served Ivan's political enemies. And by political enemies, I mean the House of Romanov, who took over the governance of Russia after the times of trouble. Portraying Ivan the Terrible as a madman who slew his heir may have served the Romanovs in establishing why they were the rightful rulers of Russia versus a descendant of Rurik. By way of footnote, the Rurikid princes had served as the rulers of Russia since the 9th century, and as such were viewed as rightful and legitimate rulers. The theory that Ivan caused his son's fatal injury does not align well with his known plans for Ivan Ivanovich, whom he was preparing as his successor. At the time of the alleged incident, Ivan had already bestowed significant military and political responsibilities upon his son. The absence of direct contemporary evidence and the presence of alternative explanations open the door to revisiting and revising our understanding of this historical event. That said, it is still generally accepted that Ivan the Terrible was the responsible party though the historical consensus is not what it was even a few decades ago. Notably, the death of this apparently competent heir led to Ivan's simple-minded son, Feodor, coming to the Russian throne following the passing of Ivan the Terrible. This would spell the end of the famous Rurik dynasty, descendants of the Viking adventurers who founded the earliest Russian states. Further, it would also plunge Russia into a horrific period of carnage known as the Times of Trouble. And trust me, there are some unsolved mysteries from that period that will be covered later. And by way of foreshadowing, let's just say that Ivan the Terrible had a lot of people who claimed to be his son, with varying degrees of success. The Kodama. Kodama. The mystical tree spirits of Japanese folklore have captivated the imaginations of many through their deep-rooted connections to nature. These spirits are believed to inhabit ancient trees, acting as guardians of the forests. They are a part of a broader class of spirits known as yokai, which encompasses a variety of supernatural creatures in Japanese mythology. The earliest mentions of Kodama can be traced back to Japan's Heian period, around the 10th century. These spirits were initially described in texts like the Tale of Genji, where they were depicted as tree-dwelling entities 
with significant mystical importance. Kodama are deeply intertwined with the trees they inhabit. Legend has it that each Kodama is linked to a particular tree, often the oldest within a forest, and their fate is tied directly to their respective tree's well-being. If the tree perishes, so does the Kodama, and vice versa. This connection highlights a symbiotic relationship, emphasizing the interconnectedness of life and the environment. One of the most intriguing aspects of Kodama is their ability to generate sounds associated with the forest, such as echoes in the valleys and mountains, which are sometimes thought to be their voices. In times past, the sounds of the forest, particularly the echoes and the noise made by falling trees, were believed to be manifestations of Kodama. In Japanese culture, it is considered unlucky to cut down a tree housing a Kodama. This belief has led to specific practices like the Shimanawa, a sacred rope tied around trees believed to be inhabited by Kodama, marking them as protected. This practice underscores the reverential approach the Japanese have towards nature, particularly ancient forests and their spiritual inhabitants. Notably, this is likely a function of the animistic beliefs that are pervasive in Japan due to Shinto religious and cultural heritage. Furthermore, Kodama are not only protectors of individual trees, but of entire forests. They are believed to ensure the health of the forests and by extension, play a role in the ecological balance of their environments. This protective role is complemented by their reputed supernatural powers, which include the ability to inflict harm on those who threaten their domain. However, when respected and honored, Kodama can also be benevolent guardians, also extending their protection to human communities. Over the years, the lore of Kodama has been woven into various aspects of popular culture from literature to films and video games. Notably, they feature prominently in the Studio Ghibli film, Princess Mononoke, where their enigmatic presence is felt through large portions of the movie. Make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell if you haven't done so already. As usual, I love you all and thank you all for your support. I really appreciate how many of you have come to enjoy my content. Shout out to my patrons Noah Schubert, Iced Mocha, Kurt the Squirt, Monoxide Wendigo, Jeffer Metcalf, Z Volts, Director Delta, Unknown Delusions, Fay, Jack Russell, and Blasphemous. Big shout out to YouTube member Jordan All. Until next time, stay safe and healthy. Peace out, everyone.